Hello, my Coffee with Brenna friends. Grab your beverage, grab your Bible. It's time for Coffee with Brenna. How are you all? Are you totally freaked out about the fact that I moved my desk? I moved my office around. Let me make you dizzy for a minute. It's not actually completely clean yet, but it doesn't look bad. Oh, you can't really see my sock monkey there. You can see the corner of him on top of that red drawer. And there's the bookshelf you're used to seeing. Now it's blocked by the printer. <laughs> but I wanted to, well, a bunch of different reasons why I moved my desk around, including the fact that I like this. So I got a new chair. The plaid chair is gone. The plaid chair, the famous plaid chair that I recorded so many of my early Coffee with Brenna videos in is in the trash. <laughs> So we had that thing. I was pregnant with Maggie and she's nine and a half. We moved here in June of 2014. And we that's when we got it. And we got it used. So the springs had fallen out the bottom and all sorts of things. So my husband got me this nice new chair. Well, we got it used. <laughs> we had to get a new cushion for it because... I'm very sensitive to smells and they had washed it with like gain or tide or something horrendously scented. So we aired it out for like two months and then we gave up. So new setup. I want to talk about some more from second Samuel today. And I was actually going to talk to you about something else, but before I could talk to you about that, I went through the aftermath of David's sin with Bathsheba and I want to review this with you. Just track with me here for a second. So last week we talked about having truth tellers in our lives, people like Nathan. So this is the next chapter after Nathan spoke with King David and King David repented. But in that chapter, Nathan talks about the consequences that will happen because of King David's choices. And in the very next chapter recorded in scripture, one of David's sons named Amnon rapes his sister, half-sister, Tamar. It's a horrible story. And then he turns her out, which in their society is just as bad as the rape because she is not a virgin and she probably will never marry. I can't go into all the details of that story, but you're welcome to go read 2 Samuel 13. And so she goes to her brother, Absalom, and he says, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. Well, that's horrible advice, first of all, if you've ever been, you know, assaulted in any way, saying, oh, don't take this to heart. That's horrible advice. And Absalom didn't take his own advice anyways. And I think what he, if he were being honest, what he would have said is, I will take revenge for you. Because two years later, Absalom went to the king and said, it's sheep shear in time. Same chapter. We're still in chapter 13. Will the king and his attendants join me? Will all your sons come? And the king said, we'll be too much of a burden for you, but you can take the sons. <laughs> the red flag should have gone off when Absalom said, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The sons, he just said general, sons and attendants and the king, but very specifically, I want my brother Amnon to come. I'm going to see if I can read this without my glasses because the glare is bothering me. I just made it 24 font and it's still a little blurry, but that's okay. So the king did initially say, why should he go with you? But Absalom pushed him and so he sent all of his sons. So Absalom in verse 28 says to his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. A report got back to David. Absalom has killed all your sons. So the king tore his clothes, lay on the ground, and then somebody came and said, No, just Amnon died. This was, it's, in fact, this is what it says in verse 32. This has been Absalom's express intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar something David did nothing about. And Absalom fled. He fled and he stayed where he was for three years. There's so much more to the story. But the short version is Joab, who was basically 
King David's right-hand man, one of them at least, but the main one we hear about. He knew the king's heart longed for Absalom, it says in verse 1 of chapter 13. So he had a wise woman dress up as a widow and give David this long story to try and persuade the king. Like, it was a parable, very similar to what Nathan the prophet did when he went to David to try and get David to repent. And at the end of the long story, David says, very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. That's verse 21. So Absalom comes back for two years without, it says in scripture, quote, without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab, again, king's right-hand man, but Joab wouldn't have him come. He sent him another time and Joab still wouldn't come. So he had his servants burn down Joab's field. This just keeps getting better and better. So Joab finally went to the king and was like, listen, your son is burning down my field because he wants to come talk to you. So the king summoned Absalom. He bowed down, kissed the king. And then in the course of time, Absalom gets chariots. He wins the people's hearts. You can read all about that in the beginning of chapter 15. And after four years of wooing the people, he basically has himself declared king. I'm going to actually maybe get back to the rest of the story in another Coffee with Brenna. You know what this makes me think of? People will say, what do you think it means in scripture, specifically in scriptures like in Deuteronomy 5 verses 9 to 10, where it says, I am a jealous God. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, it's stories like this that I think very well illustrate what we might call generational curses or generational blessings. I think of them more as like generational consequences. Now, David obviously didn't hate the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart, but he had a blind spot, maybe several, but we're just talking about one right here for women. We already know that he had quite a few wives and we'll learn at the end of this Absalom story, he also had many concubines because when he flees from Absalom, he leaves 10 behind and Absalom, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he literally pitches a tent and basically sleeps with his father's concubines in public. Obviously that was not God's intent. God's intent was not for David to have all these wives. And guess what? His son Solomon then had wives and concubines. I just finished the, reading the story of Solomon today, and they turned his heart from the Lord. Now, David gratefully repented and came back to the Lord after his sin with Bathsheba, but there were still consequences. Because David was unwilling to face his own stuff, his own sexual brokenness, sexual and relational brokenness, that got passed down to his kids and then when he didn't deal with their sin, there were consequences and repercussions. I don't completely understand generational curses and generational blessings like it talks about in scripture. The thing I take away from it is that I should choose well because it my sin doesn't just impact me. It impacts the people around me. It impacts those I serve. It impacts my family. It impacts my my husband, my children, my grandchildren. And if I choose well, that will impact for a thousand generations. Now, of course, scripture speaks in metaphors. It doesn't necessarily mean, well, after a thousand generations, no more blessings from the good choices Brenna made. It's a metaphor. And it doesn't even necessarily mean literally that the curses are three or four generations, because then you're like, well, is it three or is it four? How many generations exactly, we use the word curse, but in scripture, what I read, it said punish. How many exactly generations will be punished? Well, God knows it's a metaphor. Few, <laughs> a few generations will reap the consequences of your sin, but a thousand will reap the consequences of your good choices. And the awesome thing is, as people who maybe haven't had the best example set for them, I've been thinking about this a lot with Mother's Day passing and my own mother. We have the opportunity to say it stops here. Those bad choices, that ripple effect, those generational curses or punishments, whatever language you want to use, 
It can stop here. It can be done with me. It can end with me. I can choose Jesus. I can choose, as it says in the scripture, he will show love to a thousand generations of those who love God and keep his commandments. Oh God, that you would help me to do that. Take away from today's Coffee with Brenna a powerful, a powerfully humbling example of what happens when you don't deal with your stuff, when you don't say no to temptation, when you are outside the will of God because David wouldn't have been on that roof if he had been out fighting with the army like he was supposed to do. So rather than trying to fully wrap our minds around, is God literally punishing us? Because there's a lot of theology around that, because it says, and I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah 53, right? The punishment that brought us peace was upon Jesus. So does God still punish us? He disciplines us for sure. We know that. That's a whole nother conversation. So we could, we could dig deep into Deuteronomy 5 and be like, is God literally punishing us? like literally doling out punishments, maybe he is. However, there's good news in that passage that when we love God and keep his commandments, thousands of years of blessings will come. God doesn't quickly forget that. He remembers our good choices. He remembers how our lives honor him. So let's pray. Lord, uh, my prayer is that the takeaway from today is the ripple effect of my good choices. And the other takeaway is let, let it give me pause when, when the devil lies to me and tells me that my sin happens in a bubble and it doesn't impact anyone around me. Of course it does. But I can bless a thousand generations by loving you and keeping your commands, by honoring you with my whole heart and my whole life. And let these these chapters of 2 Samuel also give us pause and be reminded that nothing really ever gets quote unquote swept under the rug, that we have to deal with our sin and discipline our children love our children, teach our children well to choose you and to deal with things swiftly and quickly when need be. In this story, there were red flags. Even you can tell David was given pause and yet he acquiesced and lost a son because of it and almost lost his throne. So God, the the Holy Spirit in us who is truth, help us to guide us into truth, help us to see those red flags, help us to discern through your discernment. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, my Coffee with Brenna friends. Thanks for joining me again. I love to hear from you. So till next time, thanks for joining me for Coffee with Brenna.